Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered if there's got to be more to life than just chopping wood and carrying water, then do we have the We Rise Up show for you. Today I'll be talking with futurist, entrepreneur, storyteller, and filmmaker Michael Sean Conaway about his important new documentary, We Rise Up. That's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how to rise up, redefine success, and do our part in the world. That plus we'll talk about StoryWorks films, Maria Forleo, the Dalai Lama, Sean Stevenson, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Bold and Abundance, and what in the world caterpillars, butterflies, and an amino acid soup have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Michael. Are you ready to shine? Absolutely. Nice being here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here and a mighty woohoo. So before we dive right into things, and today we're going to talk briefly about your story, then we're going to talk about the message behind this documentary. But yep. before we do that, what's one way today we can begin helping ourselves and helping the world at the same time? Great. Um, I think the most important thing is actually just to listen. You've got to, you've got to check in with yourself all the time. Um, in, in our high-paced world, the thing that we're kind of bereft of is our capacity to listen to ourselves internally and listen to the world around us. So like if, if you're ever going to be able to rise up and, and make a contribution, you've got to know what the call is. What is the thing that's being called for? And then recognize, oh, yeah, that thing right now, that's the thing for me to do. And it could be something really small, some small act of kindness. You're in a grocery store line. Uh, the checkout person is obviously troubled with something or somebody said something nice to them. You just feel it. It's like, oh, yeah, this is a time where I say something nice, not to get anything or, or for any other purpose other than to, to contribute to somebody else's life. But it starts with listening. It starts being able to see the world around you. And that starts with another key word, I guess, which is presence. Right. I mean, it, it, I think uh, it's funny that, that the the, the biggest ill of our time is actually the biggest skill of our time as well. Like like the the distracted world we have, uh, that's all out there. But actually, there's there's no shortage to an end of there's no uh, shortage in, in messages and teachings around being present, and presenting. So uh, it, we live in a very interesting time that way. Now, if we roll back the clock to your earliest age, were yeah. you always interested in helping the planet? Um, I wouldn't have said the planet, but I was always super curious about people and always uh, very, very interested in any kind of spiritual notion, uh, you know, arguments about karma at the age of six. My, my dad was a psychotherapist, so all of his psychotherapist friends were around and I would, I would, you know, was the precocious kid that you probably didn't really want to have in the room arguing about things. But I was very, very driven to understand human beings and uh, you know who they were, what they were, and voraciously interested in anybody that had a, a, an idea or a thought or something that I could explore. So um, the planet came into it much later. You know, I think, and this is Wilbur talks a lot about uh, you know the kind of levels of consciousness. Obviously, as a child, I had a very child-centric or personal-centric consciousness, um, and uh, you know, I don't think it was until my late teenage years, early 20s, where I spent a lot of time alone in the wilderness that I, that I got in tune with, uh, with the planet and, and, and had some kind of feeling of affinity, not just like, oh, this is beautiful, I want to be in it, but actually had that kind of resonant affinity with, with, uh, with nature. Uh, and that, that really shaped me after that. I'm curious, was there one specific event or time out in nature that was, that was kind of a cultivating moment for you? Yeah, the, the funny thing is that it, it, it collapses to get, collides together in one place. So there's a Zen center in, in uh, uh, the Jemez Mountains. Uh, and the Jemez Mountains are in New Mexico. If you, if you know anything about New Mexico, it's got the Rockies that go up the center of it. But to the west of the Rockies is a volcanic mountain range that actually predates the Rockies. And so if the Rockies are kind of a masculine energy, the, the, the Jemez Mountains are feminine. They have lots of hot springs and hot pools. Uh, and I used to go to um, the, the Sunday sitting at the Zen center. And uh, there, you know, there was a, a a number of moments in that Zen center, which had lots of windows and, and, and ability to see out into the natural world around us, that were really the first time when I felt that kind of complete falling away of of internal dialogue, of distraction, of of the busyness of my young mind, and what would come flooding in was was what was in front of me in the, the world of the natural senses of, of of what I was seeing outside of doing the walking meditation outside in these beautiful grounds in the mountains, and um, so the the two kind of fit together really well for me. Obviously, you could go out into nature and still be really busy in your mind, and obviously you can sit 
and click, get get to a point of clarity. But having them together, I think there was that really formed me who I was. And uh, you know, um, if any of you says the the, the lucky. Uh, joy to get to the Hamas Mountains, please do and check it out for me. And, and I have some dear, dear friends who actually went and spent time at that Zen Meditation Center. So so that's near and dear to my heart in a sense, though I haven't been there yet. Yeah, uh, I do so. <laughs> <laughs> Will do so. So when did you get interested in filmmaking and were you trying to be a bridge at that time? Yeah, I I started off as a writer. Uh, I went to Naropa, the writing program there, the uh, writing and poetics program. Uh, thought I was going to be a, a writer and poet my whole life. Um, I, I became a school teacher. Uh, and then in 1993, I met my wife, uh, who was in film and interactivity in LA. Uh, so I like to say I, I met the love of my life and got my career out of the same uh, meeting, which was at 10,000 Ways in Japanese, Jap- in um, a Japanese spa in Santa Fe, if anybody knows that spot. Um, we met there. And uh, within a year of moving to LA, I was directing for interactive things. Uh, uh, Five or six years later, I was um, uh, directing television commercials and things like that. So I wasn't ever, I never thought of myself that I was going to be a filmmaker. I did stage stuff and I did writing. Uh, but once I got to that medium uh, and realized the capacity for film to have wide penetration, you know, poetry reading, you might get 20 people in the room. Uh, so for, for the ability to reach mass audiences, uh, I, I figured out, I figured that it was the way to do it early on. But it took me many, many years to to actually understand uh, what kind of messages were going to be the most impactful for me to tell in that medium. There's there's a uh, a doctor you have I don't know if it's fifty sixty guests it's some some amazing guests that you have and we rise up and we're going to dive into that in a second. But there's one guest um, who I believe his name is Doctor Z. He's kind yeah. of a kind of a rapper online, and he found the same thing that if you put it out in a medium like YouTube or in this case a documentary, that you can reach a lot more than just the one on one. Yeah, well, I think that's the. the 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 curse and the the, the miracle of modern media okay. we can put out the most inane uh, or maybe even harmful content very easily we have democratic access to, to causing great harm and we have democratic access to cause great great good um, and you know it, it, if there's any um, facet of this period of time it's it's we're no longer in like the should the individual have uh, power of society or should society have power over an individual, kind of the transcendentalist time right. of, of American history. We, it, it's done. The individual has this incredible amount of power, access to incredible amount of power. The thing we haven't gotten down is, do we have the wisdom to do that for good? Do we have the wisdom to come from a place that we actually benefit human beings, the planet, and the future? Um, and, and, we, and we see it every day. We see it playing out all the time. Uh, this lack of wisdom in our expression. And, and that kind of gets, you were talking earlier about the, the evolution and the cycles through our, our life and talking about Ken Wilber. And, and one of the challenges we have is we can broadcast anything we want now. We can go onto social media and say anything we want, but uh, either are we doing the work on ourselves or are we reflecting a residual, a shadow from the past rather than where we want to go? Yeah, now, now you're on to one of my favorite topics, which which uh, could be a whole other show, which is memetics. You know, like what are the ide- what are ideas? Memetics is a study of ideas and how they grow and change over time, yeah. and then and then ideas as they move from person to person. So the word we use in social media, meme, actually comes from this larger study of memetics. And so, yeah, ideas are using us all the time, and in fact, they're evolving through us all the time. In, in a way, uh, human lives are short; idea lives are very, very long. You know, we are still, uh, you know, Plato's ideal world is still here for us. We are still uh, expressing that idea set in one way or another. Uh, uh, Hammurabi's code, eye for an eye, is still here. Oh God, that yes. idea set is still here, and 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 the ideas last for thousands and thousands of years. Human beings are short-lived, uh, and they move through us. So, in a way, what I think about a lot for myself as an artist and a and a, a, a storyteller is, what are the ideas that I am going to pass forward? Mm-hmm. What are the things that I'm going to receive in, maybe mix together in a slightly new way, maybe evolve in some way if, if, I'm, if I have something to contribute and then pass on into to broader culture? It's a responsibility I think we have in our speech. And in Buddhism, we talk about right speech. It could not be any more appropriate for a period of time and epoch of human history than it is right now because our speech has such power. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. And and I'm curious as to your take on this because I have I have such a positive take on the world. I'm looking at all the chaos going around. Don't even dare look at the news because you're just going to go, oh my dear Lord. But I do believe that we are evolving. We're actually, this chaos is the mud for the lotus. And so do you believe, looking at memetics, do you believe that we are on a growth curve, sort of like the ages are getting, if, if we're looking you know, at, at, at a bronze age, at an industrial age, at an information age, that the ages are tightening up and we are going to be able to move past the old idea sets uh, faster than we have in the past? Well, I certainly see a lot of new ideas. So I'm I, I'm of the age that uh, you know the, the 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 generation of thinkers just before me. The uh, uh, you know, I think about Timothy Leary came to mind, or, or Allen Ginsberg, who I studied with, or or you know any one of these amazing uh, Robert Piercing and, and all that work, uh, and then Buddhist traditions, Trumpa Rinpoche, et cetera, et cetera. All these great people. I had the the occurring world for myself that. All of the great thinking has been done. That's when I get to my 30s, like all the great thinking has been done. All we need is to find a way to roll it out to the world. Uh, but what I've really found in the past 24 to 36 months is that there's a lot of new thinking going on. There is explosive new idea sets. We are uh, in a period where we are considering things that we've not really considered before, or at least not in, in my period of time. So yeah, I think, the, I, think, I think right now in this period of time, we're seeing an explosion of ideas. We're seeing new thinking and, and not only, but just people uh, really across the board being willing to think about and challenge uh, you know, closely hold structures and beliefs in ways that I've not really seen before. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm really excited. Now, whether or not that means that, that uh, we're at the ed edge of a, you know, like a seismic shift or something like that, I'll leave somebody else up to interpret that. Yeah. Uh, what I'm, I'm much more interested in is the access we have to engage in meaningful conversation, dialogue, and action. We have more access right now than I think we've had in, in, um, in at least in my lifetime to actually make big, uh, big moves on a, on a global stage. And and that makes me think that access to these conversations leads to us being more able than ever to get out of our paradigms. So we, we're stuck in a world, we're often stuck in a world, it is as it is, there's nothing I can do about it. But the more divergent opinions, the more differing opinions that you have around you, and, and, and like all the people on your, on your uh, uh, documentary, We Rise Up, are coming from such uh, different backgrounds that we go, wait a second, maybe it is as it is, isn't necessarily the case anymore. Yeah, though so it's never been the case, right? <laughs> Human beings have made up have made up stories about the world so that we can understand it and and grapple with it and live life. I mean, we, without our understanding of the world, we wouldn't be able to live. So we have to have an a understanding or an understanding that 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 is around us. And most of the time, and in the hum, all of human history, it has been what is closely held by the family or closely held by the tribe. I mean, most of our time on the planet has been like that. It's only in this past, you know, two three hundred years that we begin to have this nationwide and then global wide perspective and really only in the past 50 years where we've actually had global communication systems pop up that we've actually been able to hold all of it so our current experience is really radically new for humanity um and so so the, the that's why i think we see a lot of polarization a lot of ideologies you know people being really stuck in ideologies is actually the overwhelm to the amount of inputs that we have says oh well if i just like i'm going to double down on this thing I'm this way, you know, it's people are this way and these people are that way and those people, and, and, and it's actually just reaction. It's a, it's a, a kind of a, remune, a, a mental immune response to the fact that we have access to so much. And that's why Wilbur is so much, so important, not only to, 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 we rise up to, to the world thinking right now, the, the notion of being integral, to be able to take in differing points of view, to be able to see clearly value in something you may not hold as a belief and take that value and be, be accountable, responsible for it. Can you carry the value in somebody's opinion that you don't agree with forward? Um, that is, that's really the move for humanity right now. And, and that's a challenge I make with people on a regular basis, which is no matter what opinion, I, I see one of the challenges with Google and search engines today is that they're typically based on profit. And so they typically put you in a funnel and you end up getting more polarized in your opinion. And so it's very important that you actually throw yourself out and to the other side, which is really uncomfortable, which can be extremely scary. But, and, and you're going, well, they're just not thinking correctly. They're just this, they're just that. And if you actually take the time and see where everybody else or others are coming from, it can really start to infect in a positive way your mind. 
yeah, we we have the capacity. In fact, uh, Keats called it uh, negative capability, and it was a sign of a a a, a, a true uh, person of, of of education and thought. Negative capability is this idea of being able to hold two opposing views in your mind without having to reconcile them. So, I mean, that's nothing new for human beings. It's just new for the mass of us. And so, you know, yeah, I, and, and I think, I think two opposing views is simple minded, you know, like really there are as many views as there are people. We just yes. funnel into stories about that view. So we have a sensory experience about something. Uh, and often if it's something abstract, like those people over there or, or even the climate, like right? for most of us, we're not living in places where we're having immediate climate impact. So it's abstract and it's an abstract and scary future. Well, we relate to that in terms of story. We tell ourselves a story about that. First we do is we tell a story about well, it's going to be okay, or it's not going to be okay. And if it's not going to be okay, then it's somebody's fault because that's human beings, especially in the English language. We want to know who's at fault for causing any harm. So then we find somebody to be at fault. And this is just natural, normal narrative building in the brain. And if you understand it as story, as a story construct, just like reading a, a comic book or, a, a, you know, a, I was thinking about Zen comics or even, you know, reading, reading a, a magazine or a book, or, it's all story. And, and if you treat it like that, like this construct that helps you to kind of see something from a perspective, then you're much more likely to adopt new ones. I mean, we don't just read one author all of our life, right? We read different kinds of authors. We read nonfiction and, and, and uh, narrative. We see different kinds of movies. And I think that's also the case for the way, the way in which we might apprehend the world is if we see these as different views or different stories that are each and of themselves valuable, but not true. And, and I love that you say story because there is a story of Michael Sean. There is a story of Michael Sandler. There is the story of everything. And when we label it, this is a positive label. Usually labeling gets us in trouble. But when we label something as a story, it gives us space. Yeah. It gives us an ability to step back from our, our story and to look at it more globally. Yeah, if there's, you know, like there's, there's the, the sense world, there's the felt world, there's the Michael Sean that's living in this exact moment. I'm I'm feeling things, I'm sensing things, but I have this whole apparatus of, of, of understanding. So in Buddhism, we talk about there's awareness that's self-existing, mm -hmm. and then there's consciousness. When the consciousness is the con construct, that's when we make something of what we're aware of. And, and in, in, in these larger societal, bigger issues, they're no different than that. It's just collectively we're sense-making, and collectively we're coming up with a consciousness around that. And, and that consciousness um, is separate from us. The ideas of you know being an environmentalist is actually separate from us. It's a level of abstraction. Growing and taking care of a tree in your yard mm -hmm. is just growing and taking care of a tree in your yard. Worrying about all the trees on the planet is abstract. You're not going to touch them all. So it's a relationship with a thing that you're not putting your hands on that can be corrupted and can be used to great good. And I think that's, that's where we should be really, really tinkering around. So let's talk about tinkering today. And you made a movie, and I'm curious why you made this movie and when you made this movie, because you're trying to tinker with the planet on a global scale. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we'll talk about Wilbur once again. I'm, I'm, I'm challenging your readership to, to, go, to go have some more. You know, like he talks about these, uh, uh, you know, his levels of consciousness are really about what you hold in your consciousness. What are you holding? So I'm holding myself. I'm holding my family and myself. I'm holding my family, myself, my tribe or my nation or, oh, wow, I'm going to hold all human beings or I'm going to hold the planet or the universe. And these, these are leaps in abilities to rise up in levels of consciousness. And, and I followed that journey just like everyone else. And as I started to get to these, this level of being really thinking and holding uh, all of humanity and the planet together, um, it, it seemed to me that there are some underlying stories about who we are as human beings that needed to alter in order for us to move forward. So instead of actually tackling the problem of climate change or the problem of social injustice or inequality, I decided to tackle the problem of who we are as human beings and how we relate as a fund in a fundamental way to our lives in the world we live in. Uh, that's where the that's where the the the, the trouble started, I should say, because. Uh, you know, we, we interviewed over 150 people on these topics, um, and um, and what we got a hold of is something that, that is emergent, that's happening now for humanity, um, and that's a really different kind of, of filmmaking process to be involved in. Woohoo! So, 
I want to talk about some of the big themes. I want to talk about some of the guests. I found it fascinating that um, Sean Stevenson, who passed away very recently, yeah. uh, in fact, a dear friend of his found out right when I was on the phone or, or on the line with him about to do an interview, one of his best friends. Yeah. And, and, and Sean said, um, which, which really stuck with me today, and I'll explain why in a second, we all fracture. Is yeah. this going to be a gift and or a burden? How do, do you love your life even though you fracture? Which is interesting because I was out on a trail run yesterday afternoon. Yeah. I tripped. I didn't fall, but I broke a rib. Wow. And, and so I read, I, I read or heard. I guess heard is the better way to describe it. Usually I'm reading a book. This time it's a documentary. We all fracture. And I'm going, wait a second. I have got to ask Michael about this. Yeah. Yeah, um, Sean is such a, like, so if you look at the film, most people show up once in the film or a couple of times, you know, so I think we ended up with about 40, 45 uh, people on camera that were speaking. There's lots of other people on camera, by the way, that I won't spoil what happens in the beginning of the film, but um, there were truths spoken that were so fundamental uh, to what we were looking to express in the world. And this idea that, um, uh, you know, in, in, in you know, and Sean, I don't think Sean was a Buddhist, but he was certainly one of the, you know, kind of most Buddhist, um, enlightened being type approaches. Living I've ever seen. it. Yeah, because for him, it's like, uh, you know, like in that, that do I, you know, is he going to let his body be a burden to him? Is he going to let his, 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 his problems? And, and the answer was no, it's was just a body, right? And, and for people and, who don't know him, and I don't, I don't know the name of the condition, but he's, he's two, two and a half feet. He was in a wheelchair his whole life. In fact, that was the end of his life was the new wheelchair. Um, and, and yet he wasn't letting it stop him. No, it's just something to deal with. Just some, one, of my, one of my teachers uh, was in a, a, a workshop in a course and the guy was on the stage, you know, talking about how he had, you know, social anxiety and couldn't leave the house. And the, and the teacher just looked at him and says, wow, that's something you're going to have to deal with. Just as flat as that. And Sean exemplified that. It's like, I've got this body that doesn't work. And if I fall over, I beg, break bones. And, and, and in the end, like say it was a fall that, that causes death because of his condition. But that wasn't anything. That was just something to deal with. It was just something to handle. And so you broke a rib, you know, like what? Do you stop being your purpose? Do you stop giving your gifts because you're in some pain? No, it's, it's actually just something you have to deal with. And I think the, that the relationship, um, relationship between those fractures, no matter what they are, and sometimes for some people, I understand they are enormous. There are really, really large challenges that some people face the face. And I'm completely compassionate about that. And that's separate to who you are and what you're here to do. And sometimes if you feel uh, it, it, you know, it maybe requires some healing. Maybe actually you actually have to heal something to be able to give your gift. But it doesn't mean that you don't have a gift and you don't have a gift to give. And Sean was a great example of that. He was just fearless in giving his gift. And, and, I, and I was so happy to capture that story for him to just have people just get from it. It's like, oh, yeah, I can see that there's constraints in the world. I can see their circumstances. Okay, so what? I got to keep, I got to actually focus on what's important here. And speaking of what's important, another guest who also passed away, I'm guessing soon after filming, and I'm wondering what you learned from her because she was on many times as well. Uh, just an amazing, amazing woman, Barbara Marks Hubbard. Yeah, so Barbara, uh, Barbara, we filmed with twice, uh, uh, and I, and she, uh, her last uh, three or four years of life, she lived here in Boulder. So I got to spend a lot of time with Barbara. Barbara was uh, one of her generation's greatest gifts for us all. Um, her, her ability to hold evolutionary timescales in her mind, both going forward and going back, was extraordinary. And her, her, what she brought to us in terms of understanding evolutionary consciousness or consciousness being coming aware of its own evolution uh, changes and alters the the ground in which human beings operate um, our domain is very different and it's not that that barbara discovered these things but she told the story about these things in a way that allowed us to see the possibility for human beings um, so uh, two things about about that i feel so blessed to have had the time with Barbara and really good quality time with her on camera uh, for her to express these ideas and the stories. And then, uh, uh, again, no, no big spoilers in the film, but the last act of the film is really based upon a lot of her thinking of what are we going? What is what is the universe calling for us to be next? And um, um, the piece where we, we talk about 
time from the beginning of time and she's speaking in that and we have that amazing animation is literally one of the things I'm most proud about is that the film I feel like we did something that allowed us to put Barbara's work into a very digestible piece um, and it will it will last beyond her time on the planet. So uh, when she passed, I just felt so thankful that we had had the chance to do that and that she had had the chance to see it all before she passed as well. Very, very cool. And and shifting gears real briefly, then we're going to come back to a few more of the people who are in the film, is is your ability, and you could see it from the from the, the, the text and the first few words in the film, your ability to play with color and text and graphics was phenomenal. Was Thank you. really, really, really cool. So uh, just a huge kudos there. I'm like, this guy gets color. He gets it. And, and, and it just brought things to life. And so the animation truly brought things to life. Uh, I'm not sure how much you spoke with the Dalai Lama when making this. I did not. The, the Dalai Lama is the only person I didn't personally interview. Um, he came to Boulder three and a half years ago and wasn't well. In fact, he went from his event here in Boulder to um, to the Mayo Clinic. And I don't, I don't, I wasn't privy to any of the things going on with him. But he's he's in that age of life where you know physical concerns are larger than interviews for sure. Um, and so uh, there's a, a, a translator, uh, she's French, that uh, arranged this interview and, and asked these questions that I needed to get or was interested in getting for for the thing. And it, I think one of the few interviews he's done in the past five years. Um, and so we were able to get that, those little nuggets from him. And it was, you know, like uh, the, um, obviously a guy like the Dalai Lama, you put anything in his field and he immediately generates the the kind of perfect idea and response from that it was it was actually kind of astonishing how great he was what'd you learn well you know i think the thing that that uh you know the thing that's for me personally uh that that hits is his way of being with the circumstances of the world is extraordinarily different than you and i he has he has uh uh the awakening and uh, the awakening of humanity and and as we say in buddhism like wet to water with awakening comes this quality of compassion the awakening of human beings to who they really are and the compassion in them uh, you know that's it's just an order of magnitude higher than most of us can even dream of of operating at intellectually i understand and and in my heart i feel these emotions, these deep feelings of profound compassion. And I know in my Buddhist practice that when you have an awakening moment and you feel liberated from uh, the, you know, the everyday mind, the inner talk, you suddenly feel compassion for people who have burden of that. But the level that the Dalai Lama is talking about, it just rolls off of him in ways. Every time I've been with him, I am a better human being just in the, in the, in the being with him in person. So, uh, you know, I hope that comes across in the film. I hope that he brings a little bit of that, uh, you know, very, very large consciousness to the, to the, to the experience. Very, very cool. And, and another guest who is a personal favorite of mine, who just brings such an amazing energy in whatever she's involved in, Lisa Nichols. Yeah, Lisa's crazy. She's just amazing. Like, she's like, uh, she, uh, you know, like I think of like, uh, you know, like what well, fire NATO, right? Like <laughs> a little tornado, but there's, there's this light and energy and, and, uh, wow, she's so like that. And, um, you know, that she's, she's, I think she was, what she was the dark horse of the secret, right? Like, like the one that yeah. nobody knew of. And then she became one of the most influence, influential voices in that, you know, her stand for humanity's greatness is, is so profound. And then, uh, her ability to deliver that message with passion. I just, I'm, I'm like, wow. Can I, I, I want to go out dancing with you. You're like, if we're, let's go, let's go out for a night out. I'm going to feel like a, a much larger human being after I'm done. Awesome. And then we'll talk about one or two more guests. And then I want to dive into where humanity is going and, and really the, right. and without giving it away a last t- third of the film, because I, I, you and I view humanity as a very different, well, I'm not even sure vehicle is the right w- word to use it. A different whole world view. So first off, Peter Diamandis. Yeah. Peter, uh, you know, they're again one of the the the, the greatest futurists of our time, and 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 all that. But he understands that um, if there are problems that need to be solved, you can actually motive, uh, uh, mobilize people to do it. And 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 it's it, like his problem to solve is how to get people to solve problems. And that's just that's extraordinary that that he cracked the code on that, you know. And his passion about space travel and 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 humanity in space, you know, I think he was very frustrated by 
by America, the 80s and 90s and early 2000s in the sense that it wasn't a, we weren't a species that was going to space. We just weren't. You, anybody that knew anything about it was like, we're punting. You know, like we're kicking the can down the road as far as our ability to, to be really a, a species that, that reaches out into existence and tries to understand things. And so he dedicated his life to, to basically uh, you know, bootstrapping the space industry we have today. And now we have a very different landscape from when he started. And now he's applying that technology to healthcare and to education and all kinds of other um, XPRIZE type type approaches. And I think in that, in his own education of himself and discovering that, he's become one of the greatest voices for humanity and for this hopeful idea that actually, you know what, we can figure it out. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going down, but we can figure it out. He, I think he's the leading voice of that right now, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. How do we, and this, this is one of the challenges that, that our audience has, when we're struggling in the day-to-day, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, when we're chopping wood and carrying water, and, and, and we're so given with information overload on why you're supposed to be burdened. How in the world do we start to step back and move beyond ourselves? It's almost how do we become selfish to become unselfish? Uh, I'll, I'll, kind of, I'll rephrase that a little bit. Where do we place our attention? Yes. Like where do we, we place our attention? It's really funny because my brain went two directions, they said. And the first one is when you chop wood and carry water, chop wood and carry water. That's it. Don't do anything else. Like really, if, if you're in the moment of being with your child at dinner time, don't be thinking about other things. Don't be doing other things. Really do that thing fully. You know, and that's the, the lesson of Zen, like complete presence. Um, chop wood and carry water, do it completely and, get, and great, gain great joy out of that. And then when you get to the problems of the world, when you get to the overwhelm, when you get to the, the info wars attacking you for all sides, by the way, just step off Facebook for a little while, first of all, <laughs> go for Thank a walk. Um, uh, but, you know, one, one of my teachers always said, if you think you have problems or if you think you have things that are burdened, you're not playing a big enough game. When you play a big game, your problems start to pale in comparison. And the human being is a, like, like we'll focus on anything. If we got a little itch that we can't scratch, let's say you got a, a cast on and you got a little itch down in here, yeah. just a few cells saying, hey, scratch me, scratch me, and you can't scratch that itch, we go crazy. Like it's the most important thing in the world. It, it literally can drive us bananas. Um, and, and yet, if you look at our capacity, our power on the planet, we don't want to be eat beings running around scratching a bunch of itches. Like, oh, I've, I've got to get my coffee and I get my, no, I got to do this. And no, I want to check into this thing and that thing. We literally become, a, 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 you know, like, I don't know if you, have, if you have dogs and they scratching on their ears. That's how we apply our attention. If you apply your attention to something you care about that's global or large, maybe it's something in your town or in your neighborhood, uh, something that, that you feel either A, really called to create in the world, like a gift that you want to bring, or B, that you feel just profound anguish over something existing if you tackle that then suddenly our 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 itches are no longer as important uh they may they may be there we may need to scratch them from time to time but we get our ourselves engaged in something that's larger than ourselves and that generates a different experience in life uh, especially if we start to lock arms as as uh as it said in the movie with other people trying to accomplish those same things suddenly we become larger than our own concerns larger in our consciousness, awareness, and also larger in our power to affect those things. I love that. And if we look like from a biological perspective, you help another person, not only are you getting happy drugs and endorphins, but we're literally biologically wired to get oxytocin, the love drug, by helping somebody else. And so we can literally feel better and our problems do in a sense. That, that itchy ear does in a sense melt and go away. That's right. It does. It literally does go away, actually. <laughs> There's a whole other meditation practice you can do on those things. Uh, and, and, it, and, you know, Zen is a, a great tradition for wrestling with these things of literally just focusing on the thing that's bothering you and just like breaking down. It's, is it there? Is it not there? Is it there? Is it not there? Is it there? Now is it not there? And eventually you just begin to realize it's on and off and on and off. And in our kind of continuous experience of, of the world can, if examined properly, just start to fall apart. Um, it's almost like, a, you know, like a, in film, we say, you know, it runs at 24 frames a second, but they're all still frames and our brain stitches them together. Well, if you meditate long enough, your brain will start to unstitch the fabric of, of the world. And then it becomes kind of comical. It's like, oh, do I really have an itch? 
Is there an eye to have an itch? I mean, all these things become become uh, available to us in a very playful and light way. Well, you uh, could even so, go quantum on it and say that itch is flipping back and forth. <laughs> right. It's a wave. It's a particle. So, you know, I lived in Boulder for a long time. I was a competitive cyclist, raced in Europe, training at the Olympic Training Center. And I have this strange vision of an Olympics for the future. Yeah. Where all the athletes and teams work together yeah, to great. see what we can achieve as a group. Do yeah. you think we're reaching the end of the road for humanity as a competitive species? Yeah, absolutely. I'll put it, I'll lay it down for you really quick. If you have uh, limited resources, uh, as those resources become more and more limited in a competitive world, uh, the only natural choice to get to the resources is actually to result to things like killing. Uh, we have uh, killing technologies that, that can kill on global scales. Uh, so if we get to the point where our, we have resource scarcity, let's talk about water, let's talk about clean air, let's talk about soil that can grow food, um, it, it pretty much spells the end of humanity. And the only way out of that is to break the, the cycle of the tragedy of the commons. Tragedy of the commons, for everybody just remember, is in a commons that has a certain resource. Uh, if I'm a competitor in that commons and I feel that somebody else is going to exploit the commons, I have to exploit it faster than they do to, to, to ensure my survival. So we have to break the competitive cycle. We have to get to uh, what we call anti-rivalry. Not only is that a win-win, but it's the conditions of our system actually uh, work against any kind of competitive impulse for human beings. That doesn't mean we can't compete. Competing is just fine. We can have a basketball game. It doesn't really matter. But when we compete on global scales where lives are at stake, uh, it's, it is literally the dark side of humanity at this point. We have to find ways to take competition out. And bad news is that means we've got to take inequality out. The bad news is that for the, the, those of us who are in the upper echelons of, of being privileged on this planet, we have to be willing, and I'm going to say this really carefully because I mean, I mean something very specific. We have to be willing to go, we have to be willing to let go of moment by moment luxuries. What I mean by that, fast fashion, fast foods, um, fast, uh, fast anything, anything where we get a short term hit. And we have to, to start valuing the long term values uh, health, health for everybody, uh, good food for everybody, clean water for everybody, clean air for everybody. We can actually, given those kinds of factors, have a better quality of life than we've ever had, and every single human being can have it, but it's got to be equal. The minute it's unequal, then we have this competitive drive. And, and so it's one of the biggest hurdles we have to do as humanity. The good news is that we've got our minds wrapped around the problem. Now, the future, I, I, one of my favorite um, uh, uh, William Gibson quotes is, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Well, those of us who are seeing this, we are on the edge of the future where we are seeing, wow, how do I begin to invent uh, health uh, on a systemic level uh, for all, not for mine and me, how do I do for all? And how does that become something that's replicable so that that little pocket of the future that's here now for me and maybe a collection of people starts to get distributed across the whole, the whole system? Um, and uh, you know, that's a pretty es esoteric notion, but we have to get into experimentation with these things. And we have to, in small groups, figure out how to make these things work. And we have to find many different solutions. They're not like one centralized solution bank that we need to come up with. We actually need to solve it from many different angles. Um, and maybe this one, and I'll give a little shout out to my favorite book on the topic, which is Finite Infinite Games, written by James Kars, yeah. written in the mid, mid 80s. Uh, everybody should read that book right now. Too. You could read the first 20 pages and be an expert in finite and infinite games. Uh, but it's something that I feel that, that you know, the, two, the, the very two big things, and they, we addressed them well in the movie, the big, very two big things that we have to tackle are anti-rivalry and closed-loop materials economy. We have to stop extraction as our way to have materials. And well, given those two things, we've got a bright future. No, it, 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 it makes me think of, I, I, I guess, the two terms would either be us versus them or just the simple two words, over there. There is yeah. no such thing as over there anymore, is there? No. Well, no. I mean, and there never was. <laughs> There's just this, just this lo locus of consciousness, which is awareness showing up in me. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, like there's so much wrapped into this, our fear of death, our fear of illness, our fear, you know, like a fear of being fractured, like Sean was talking about, that's all wrapped up into why we have these these behaviors that benefit us over others. And then tragedy of commons means that if I don't take care of myself, nobody else is going to take care of me. 
So we, we have a structure which, which emphasizes um, our competitiveness and our isolation and the, and the illusion that we're not one. It's, or, and I should, I'll take the Buddhist term, you know, the, the delusion that we're not one. It's, it is completely uh, not what the reality of things are. Yet we see it that way. I can remember back, I got a couple master's degrees. And one of them, I, I was in big trouble with the professor because it turns out I had worked with other students in the class. And he uh, said, we can't have that. We have a distribution curve. And you must compete against the other students because there are limited A's, there are limited B's, there are limited C's. I can't have you working together. And my mind went, and I said it specifically to him, I don't get it. I would think we all want to work together. Yeah. And, and I actually, he actually ended up giving me a special test where if I didn't get a certain grade proving that I knew it myself, I was actually going to be kicked out of the program. Yeah. Thankfully, did fine on the test. <laughs> but these individual decisions, these individual moments of I don't get it, I yeah. want to cooperate. How important are they today? Well, it's fundamental. I mean, it's fun. Like, like we are not roving bands of, of, of tribes in a forest anymore where we can avoid each other. The, the, the planet's full. We're filled up, right? Like we may, may even have more coming on. So like, like it's either it's either collaborate and cooperate or, or let another species arise out of the ashes of our species that knows how to do that. So either we transcend what has made us the dominant species and become uh, the stewards of all, the, uh, the co-creator with all, or, or you know, I don't, I don't think evolution is going to be kind to us. I just don't. I, like, it's a like self-correcting we, we are either, mechanism. That's right. It's self-healing. And, and like either we're going to be part of the healing solution or we're going to be what's healed. And that's fine by me, by the way. I'm okay if, if – I, 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 you know, in the last act of the movie, we talk about self-organizing universe and then the evolution of consciousness. Consciousness will continue to evolve. It might evolve on universal timescales, not human timescales. It may take you know, another 100 million years to produce another you know, uh, level above where we're, we're up. I, I, I have no ability to grasp that. I just know that, that we maybe are the first species that can choose that evolutionary leap. Versus having to be put to extinction or just push down the, 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 the history, like in the history books. Oh, there, those are the Homo sapiens. Yeah, they, they played a role. We can actually transcend that and can consciously evolve into, into the next state of human beings. We have the understanding, both spiritually, intellectually, and physically on the planet to do that. Now it's just organizing ourselves, getting together, figuring that out. What can we start to do on a daily basis in our lives to help shift this needle? So um, the movie is really clear about this in, in a kind of the very personal realm. It's discover your gift, find your purpose, really figure out what lights you up, figure out what when you do this thing, mm -hmm. it makes a massive contribution. Orient your life around that contribution. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, be non-materialist if possible. Let's not consume things anymore. Uh, move away from co consumption. Move away from aggregating wealth. Move towards aggregating contribution. You do that by yourself, we're going to be much better off. And that can be, like I say, very small things, like kindness in a grocery store. Rising up is not just a, a large thing. It's a it's a moment by moment. Who am I and what am I giving in the moment versus who am I and what am I taking in the moment? Yes, there are times when we receive. That's great. Receive with openness and blessing. But this feeling of, of needing and taking and needing and taking is, is an old model. We have to give and give and give and give and give and give. Um, and then collectively, hey, figure out how to make our organizations target towards that transitionary step would be uh social ventures and companies that do good and and uh, and make money um you know that we have to be having our efforts go towards um, um elevating the planet you know rising up the 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 floor for everybody um and then ultimately if you can hold the big consciousness and help help steward people shifting making these shifts yourself if you can help people move to contribution model if you can help organizations do good really do good and have big impact in the work too if you can be part of a political movement that moves us away from divisiveness and 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 the polarization that has crippled our capacity to govern ourselves or if you can think of another governance system at a large level by all means do um, the universe is organizing through us and the thing that we have to give, the thing that we feel called to, is the universe organizing to us. And we need to trust that. 
So th there's so many different directions I can go with this. One of the things that's coming to me is, is we're actually talking about play. We're talking about play on a global scale, talking about finding that passion, that calling, that purpose that's within us and saying, what can I do to play with this? And that's actually allowing as consciousness is evolving, it's allowing the universe to speak through us yeah. to create something new. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I like, I like the word play and I also just like the, 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 I like the idea of getting out of the way. I mean, if you're trying really hard, uh, and I don't mean trying to learn something or trying to practice something, because learning and practicing are really important, but sometimes we're trying to be something we're not, and that doesn't work. And you know if, you know if you're trying to be something you're, you're not because you feel constricted, you feel constrained, you feel confused, I don't understand things might be something that comes up in your mind. Uh, clarity is really what you want, and clarity means that we can let go and stop being uh, a driver of our expression and our experience. And we can start to like come through whatever needs to come through. I was working with a leader this morning um, and we were talking about a speech. We're doing a, a thing called a future search. It's where you bring an organization, you imagine the future of the organization 10 years out with all the stakeholders. And I said to him, uh, you need to do an opening conversation here at the beginning. And I said, what kind of person are you? The kind of person we're gonna script something and write it out and get you get you a, 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 a you know a bullet point list, a PowerPoint, et cetera, et cetera. Or are you the kind of person that likes to just Freeform it. He says, you know what? If you give me the four or five things I need to say and I can meditate on that, then God will speak through me in the moment. And I just thought that's it. That's exactly it. That's what we're talking about. Can you be the person that, that God, if you call it God or the universe or spirit or whatever inspiration is, can you be that? And so then now, 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 now we understand why we need spiritual practices and we need to clean up our emotional garbages and we need to get our body healthy so that we can be that, that that instrument, that conduit to that larger wisdom. Um, and I'm, I'm a Buddhist, so I, I think of it non-theistic ways. I don't think of a, of a person, but I do think that, you know, if awareness is self-existing before our consciousness, mm -hmm. the closer we can get to that pure awareness, which I do, uh, I do, I do have a firm belief that has compassion and holding all of humanity and all of consciousness, and maybe even all of time inside of it at one single instant, like that's something to get next to. That's something to unleash on the world as much as we possibly can. And then when we can't, when we're constrained or we're blocked or we're conflicted or we're fractured, as Sean says, then we got to heal those things. We got to deal with that and heal them and so that we can get closer to that capacity. Uh, and then I think as we age or as we gain experience, mm -hmm. we actually start to have the ability to be both constricted and open. We have the, proud, the ability to be fractured and still a conduit. And so that's, that's just part of the practice and the journey. And the more of us that do that, then obviously the more, uh, uh, the more, I don't think we raise the consciousness. I think we open the gateway to consciousness. I think we, we create more of a channel to that in the world. And I don't think it looks like anything. I don't think it looks like it, it comes in any form. I don't think that it has an agenda other than raising complexity and consciousness that's the only thing that i can see that this that, that it's growing richer and richer and richer on universal cosmological scales obviously <laughs> like me may not get to see that every moment in our lifetime but i trust that that's what's going on and that that whatever's trying to come through me is in service to that Woohoo! <laughs> it it brings us back full circle today. It brings us back to presence. It brings us back to listening and to what I call the two-step dance. And that's not just chop wood, carry water. That's dive in on the inside. So as you call it, we can be closer to that which is so that it can come through us. And then so we can take action and step forward. Wow. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, awesome, awesome. So we're going to do a few wrap-up questions. We're going to do a meditation. First off, um, we haven't really gone into the climate here today. That's just one of the many pieces of this challenge, although maybe the one that's looming closest to us, at least one of, one of the top ones, nuclear, that, inequality. Oceans, what do you want to tell us? Yeah, uh, you know, like you, we, any one of these things, you know, if this is your area of passion, we went to the Ocean Conference at the UN, and um, the ocean is under the under the the ocean is unseen for most of us. If we were driving down the highway, and by the way, this is something that states have gotten good at doing, which is cleaning up the garbage on the sides of the highway and not actually cleaning up 100 yards into the, the forest. You know, when we see the ocean as this beautiful thing and we don't see inside of it, we don't see the pollution that we're putting in there, uh, um, 
we become ignorant. And I think right now the ocean is just certainly a place where we need to place our focus. Um, and plastic. I mean, plastic on the ground and plastic in the ocean. We, you know, France just passed a law outlawing single-use plastics. There should not be any use of single That's plastic. Huge. And I, I like, like, yes, we we got our Ziploc bags and we wash them until they kind of like, like, don't work anymore because they're a really functional <laughs> piece. But the, like, I just ordered another, uh, you know, uh, seventy-two glass jars so we could have more glass in our house and more things that are re recyclable, washable. Glass is great; it's made of silica, breaks down to silica, absolutely recyclable. We know how to do these things that are good for for the world. Uh, plastic is is probably the thing that every single one of us could uh, try to remove from our our world as fast as we can. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And is there one other consumption choice other than absolutely consuming less? And, and I'm in my grocery stores looking at even what plastic they're using because I understand very few of them are actually really being recycled. And I'm putting right. those comment notes and I'm calling in. What is one other consumption choice we can make today that makes a difference? Yeah, um, uh, great. I think, I think that it, it, falls, uh, it falls, it's more of a, a global category. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, invest in, in things that have long-term value. Uh, try to try not to try buy. I'd rather you buy something that's expensive that's going to last a decade than something that's going to be disposable in six months. So we have to start an, analyzing our purchases by like, well, why am I buying this and how long am I buying it for? And if there's a real need, maybe I should buy something that's going to last a lot longer. And if not, maybe I don't need to buy it at all. Uh, my, my dad was very, very wise on this. He taught me from an early age, not that I've always listened, but it drives me insane when I'm on Amazon today and I look at how this violates this rule. If you don't have enough money to buy it once, you don't have enough money to buy it twice. That's right. <laughs> I like that. Well, see, that, and there's some old, like, like we used to have pretty good values around materials. Mm -hmm. But the fast culture, the fast, uh, uh, you know, get, get what you want for cheap culture has really washed a lot of that out. We need to go back to some of those old, thing, old ways of thinking. And that production, those things that we're buying that are very inexpensive and we think, well, it's being produced over there. Well, where do you think that air that's being dirtied over there is headed? It's a global, it's a global world. There's no way. So where can people go? to find your amazing documentary, and it's not out quite yet. When does it come out? Where can people go to find it and to find out more? Yeah, uh, weriseup.com. Go sign up for the mailing list. We'll let you know when the film releases. It'll be released in wide distribution early next year. Um, you can engage with us on our Facebook page. There's like 70 videos from these influencers if you want to get a little snippet from them. Uh, yeah, and, and, and then when you get to the point, uh, there's a place where you can put your name in the, in the thing if you want to do an educational event or something to bring people together. We're really hoping people host a lot of um, viewing parties so they can have a larger conversation around the film when they get there. So that answers the next question. Question, what can we do today in this moment to take action? And one of the things is we can go to We Rise Up and we can find a way to become a part of the movement. That's right. Perfect. Woohoo! Any last words of wisdom, Michael, before we jump into a meditation? Uh, no. Go, go, uh, go find yourself. Give your gifts. Uh, you know, get, make your contribution and everything is going to get solved that way. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Would you mind leading us in a short guided meditation, whatever you feel called today? Sure. Um, so one of the things that, that, that I want you just to take a minute and be with is that you are the recipient of hundreds of generations of human beings, wisdom, knowledge, um, uh, commitment, work, and love. Uh, if you think back to uh, the founding of the United States or the founding of the great democracies or the move from uh, only controlling families having wealth to having democratized wealth. Uh, you look at uh, our capacity to move around the planet and connect with each other, or even the technology that we're using right now today. If you think about that for a minute, every bit of that is extraordinary. And every bit of it is a gift that's being given to you in this moment. You're standing on top of a mountain of extraordinary contribution. Every gift that you have was given to you by your ancestors. Every bit of wisdom, every bit of health, all are present in you because of what they stood for in the past. And you stand at this present moment, if you just relax and think about 
the future generation just, just in front of you. Your children, or if you haven't had children, the children you might have, or the children that are in your family, nieces and nephews. If you think about them and you see what they're inheriting and that you're part of their inheritance now, that your growth and your development and your spiritual um, groundedness is present in their world, you can get connected to where that starts to head. So we have the next generation, then we have our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. And just for a minute, let your mind continue expanding through generations, expanding out, and just lightly touch each generation one after the other. I'm going to take you forward to a moment a thousand years from now. A thousand years from now, 30 generations have passed, and you are the direct ancestor to a billion people on the planet. In a thousand years, you will be the ancestor to a billion people. What are the gifts that you're going to send forward to that time? What is it that you want to have present in those ancestors' lives? If you can come up with that, let that be your meditation for today. <laughs> Thank you lovely. so much, Michael. You're very welcome. Lovely being with all of you today. Um, the rest of my world is calling on me now. I am going to be Gobia service. So thank you so, so much. Just got to wrap things up. Got to crank it up for the finish. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, check out We Rise Up and begin redefining your success and ours today and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so, so much for this, Michael, and for all that yeah. you do. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. I just had the most amazing interview with Michael Sean Conway on We Rise Up. To check out more incredible videos on improving your life and the lives of those around you, click here, subscribe below.